In this, our 250th anniversary uh, lecture, I want really to cover a series of topics. I want us to uh, discuss, to look a little bit at uh, the founder himself, uh, Richard Robinson, uh, how he actually founded or went about setting up uh, this library that is celebrating its 250th anniversary this year. Uh, look at the building itself uh, that he created and how it has uh, grown and developed uh, over the years. Uh, the collections that is that are housed within the library and then something about how those collections have been uh, used and uh, I'll take that up uh, to the present uh, day. So let's turn uh, to the first of those, uh, the founder, uh, Richard Robinson himself. Uh, Robinson uh, was born in 1708 in Rokeby in uh, Yorkshire. Uh, into a reasonably uh, wealthy uh, gentry uh, family. He, he was educated at school in Westminster and went on to uh, Christ Church in Oxford and uh, came to Ireland uh, first in 1751, uh, accompanying uh, the Duke of Dorset, uh, who was the Lord Lieutenant or the uh, King's representative in Ireland. As was the case uh, with previous uh, chaplains to the Lord Lieutenant, they usually tended to secure uh, reasonably high up posts uh, within uh, the Church of Ireland uh, shortly after accompanying uh, the Lord Lieutenant to Ireland, and that was no, and Robinson was no exception. And you can see there listed the various bishoprics that he held before finally he uh, was uh, elevated to the Archbishopric of Armagh and uh, Primate of All Ireland in uh, 1765. Um, which would make him uh, 57 uh, when he uh, took on uh, that particular uh, role. You can see him uh, here uh, painted by uh, Angelica Kaufman, and uh, we look at some other uh, portraits of him uh, a little bit later. Unlike uh, previous archbishops uh, who tended to reside in Drogheda, so that they could be nearer to uh, the Irish capital in Dublin and the House of Lords, uh, which they would have uh, sat in. Robinson was a, a less political prelate and instead uh, decided to uh, base himself within Armagh itself. Uh, when he came uh, to Armagh in 1765, there was a, a residence for uh, the Archbishop of Armagh in English Street, but it had become rather uh, dilapidated. It was in a starry state of repair, just really because um, it hadn't been uh, used and there had been uh, centuries of conflict and warfare uh, before that. So the first thing he did was set about finding uh, a building, a new palace uh, for uh, the Archbishop. And uh, that occupied from 1768 to 1770. And um, it uh, was then used by the Archbishops of Armagh really for two centuries or just over two centuries until uh, the 1970s when uh, the Archbishops moved to the new sea house just across the road from the library. And uh, the palace then is now today the mayoral headquarters of Armagh, Bambridge and Pagalvin Council. Now, in Robinson's time, it wasn't quite as tall as it is there on screen uh, as it is today. It was only two stories high. The third story was added in the 1820s by Archbishop uh, J.G. Uh, Beresford. To the side of uh, the palace, uh, a little later in the mid-1780s, he built himself a private chapel. And you can see it there, almost dwarfed uh, by uh, the uh, palace. Um, I told you I was going to show you a couple more paintings uh, of him. Uh, he was probably one of the most depicted um, uh, uh, Irish uh, clerics uh, of uh, the 18th uh, century. We've already looked at the Kaufman painting. These two here are by um, Sir Joshua Reynolds, probably the foremost uh, painter of uh, the 18th century. The first uh, on uh, the left there in 1763 really depicts him as a scholar. Um, whereas uh, the one on the right uh, in 1775, this one was painted, it shows him in, uh, I suppose, the guise or dress, almost like a country gentleman and uh, an improver of the landscape. And those two uh, things, I suppose, encapsulate uh, certain aspects of uh, uh, Robinson. After building the palace, he then set about on sort of two and a half decades of rebuilding uh, work uh, within uh, Armagh uh, setting, really trying to elevate it to uh, the status of, um, uh, in keeping with the status as um, the ecclesiastical capital of uh, Ireland. 
The library was the first of those public buildings in 1771, but it was only the first in a series. In 1772, um, the registry uh, was created uh, no, at number five at Vickers Hill. Uh, 1774, the county infirmary just across the road uh, from uh, the library, it's now the building control offices uh, for uh, the council. Uh, the Royal School was recited from Abbey Street uh, to its current location in College Hill uh, with the new building uh, paid for by Robinson in 1774. He uh, also uh, built a jail uh, in 1780, and his last public building uh, within Armagh was the renowned Armagh Observatory, uh, which was built between 1789 and 1791. Uh, as well as this, uh, he also uh, created, or uh, most Armagh knows Mal, uh, the Green Park at the centre of uh, Armagh enjoyed the generations of Armagh people for recreation known as the Commons and was actually a race course and he changed it into this public uh, park. In terms of the building works that he had carried out in Armagh, he used some of the best uh, known or renowned uh, architects and craftsmen. In particular, until his death in 1784, he uh, used in particular uh, Thomas Cooley, who was an English-born architect who first came to Ireland um, in the late 1760s when he designed this building, or he won a competition uh, to design it. It's the Royal Exchange Building and now the City Hall in Dublin. And it was uh, really the first building to introduce neoclassical uh, architecture in, into uh, public buildings within Ireland. And it caught the eye of the attention of uh, Richard Robinson, the Archbishop of Armagh, and he invited him north uh, to uh, undertake the building works, the first uh, being uh, the, the library. And within the library to the present day, there are several drawings uh, dating from 1770 and 1771, uh, depicting uh, the, the architectural plans uh, for the library. And this is what the library uh, would have looked like when it was first built. As you can see, it's slightly more modest building, smaller than it is uh, today. It also is that sort of uh, pinkish uh, hue that you would have had, say, on the infirmary building and several of the other uh, buildings that he was associated with, like the Royal School and uh, so on. And in total, it cost three thousand pounds uh, to build the library in uh, 1771. Um, he uh, built, uh, I suppose, a very elegant building, but he also uh, wasn't uh, overly extravagant and probably had in the back of his mind. Uh, the experience of his elder brother Thomas uh, back in Rugby, who sort of bankrupted himself and, and lost the, the ancestral uh, family uh, seat there uh, through his architectural activities. The uh, picture here uh, from the plans and drawings of Cooley also uh, very much is what appears on the medal that Robinson had struck to commemorate the founding of the library. So again, I told you he was very into sort of self-promoting himself and raising his profile uh, through painting and so on. Here you have him depicted on one side of the medal and the library building in the other. And round the edges you'll see a Greek inscription, which I will translate for you a little bit uh, later. From the beginning, uh, the library was uh, built to not only house books, but also to be a residence for the keeper or for uh, the librarian. And uh, as well as uh, the rooms uh, for housing the books, you can see there are like parlour, dining halls, and outside you had cow houses and all the other things that went with uh, a residence at that period. In the 1840s then, as the amount of books and collections began to grow, it was decided that the library needed to be extended. That work was carried out by an architect called Robert Law Montserrat, uh, who actually won a competition uh, to uh, design the extended uh, building. And this is what he came up with. This would be something that's very familiar today to the people of Armagh. And really the three central windows there uh, were the original building that Robinson had uh, built in 1771 and uh, the new extension in the uh, 18th, mid 1840s was really adding a bay or uh, an extension of either end of the building. Until uh, that period in the 1840s, in order to go to the book room or the long room as it's known, which is up on the first floor, um, and inside those top uh, five uh, windows, uh, you would have had to go up uh, the uh, flight of stairs through the keeper's residence. 
So in the 1840s, uh, when they were doing the extension and refacing the whole building, they also decided to add a new door uh, to the east side, and that's the public uh, entrance that uh, is used uh, now. And it means that visitors can come in and out without uh, disturbing uh, the adjoining uh, residence uh, building. If you look closely uh, up uh, towards the top of the building, you will see that same uh, Greek inscription that you had on the medal that uh, Robinson had struck to commemorate the founding of the library. And translated uh, from Greek, it means the healing place of the soul. And Robinson tended to put mottos on his building. The buildings of one of the observatory uh, being uh, from one of the Psalms, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. But really, uh, from uh, the 1840s onwards, the library has changed very little uh, from uh, both the inside and outside, the only exception being the addition of the spiral staircase in 1914 there to get up uh, into uh, the galleries from the long room and again not having to access it through uh, the residence. As you can see, there's uh, the outside of the building in the late 19th century uh, and the inside in the late 19th century. Not really a huge difference, maybe some furnishings have got moved around or uh, changed uh, through the years. In terms of how uh, the books uh, were arranged, they're still arranged as they were uh, from the very beginning. So they're not arranged by subject or by author. They're actually arranged by size and probably the size that they came in. And so if you look very closely, sorry, the order that they came in uh, and placed on the shelves. If you look very closely, you see the larger books uh, are down on the lower shelves. And the smaller ones are further up at the top, and that's because uh, the staff, even right up to the present, are using ladders to get up and down uh, to get those books, and it's a lot easier to, to lift out and uh, we put back uh, the smaller books uh, in uh, the top uh, shelves. And very much, I suppose, it's a type of architecture for libraries at this time. You wanted to have, uh, I suppose, show off uh, all of your books, and you can see all of them there uh, from, from any point, really, uh, within uh, that uh, long room. And really from floor to ceiling, with the exception of the windows uh, and the doors, uh, every inch is uh, taken up uh, by books. And uh, the, the windows uh, on that north facing side give um, light uh, into it. And that obviously would have been very much uh, required before electricity, uh, electric lighting was added in uh, 1928. In terms of uh, Robinson himself, he gave uh, orders that all his papers were be burnt on his uh, death. So unfortunately, we don't have the insights that that would give in terms of how he built up the collection and where he sourced the things we do. I uh, know, for example, that you know there were booksellers within Armagh and that there were prints and engravings and so on being sold uh, in Armagh uh, in uh, the 1770s and so on. But um, as I say, all that uh, was uh, burnt uh, on his instructions uh, given to his uh, executors. Uh, the only uh, surviving uh, printed work uh, that we have uh, of his is this sermon from uh, 1757. And the library also acquired one uh, stray manuscript uh, letter uh, just uh, within the last couple of years. And that's really all that, that we have written uh, by Robinson within uh, the collection uh, itself. In terms of then getting a sense of why did he want to uh, set up the library, I suppose uh, the best uh, surviving um, material in that is the Act of Parliament that he had uh, the Irish Parliament in Dublin passed in 1773. And it really is an act for settling and preserving a public library in the city of Armagh forever. And within that, uh, it says that his reasons, and I've underlined in there, are for the general inclinations to the public good of this kingdom, for the propagation of the Christian religion as by law established, uh, he, that's the Church of Ireland, of which he was the, the primate or, church, or, or archbishop, and for the encouragement of uh, learning. And actually, uh, as uh, well, a little bit later uh, uh, in as well, he uh, provided £5,000 for the founding of a, a, a university uh, within Armagh, uh, that didn't uh, happen, but you can kind of see his um, thinking to, uh, behind uh, trying to create uh, a centre of learning uh, within uh, Armagh. The act, uh, I should say, was also very much based on a similar act in 1707 for March's uh, Library in Dublin. Uh, within the act, uh, it set up the legal structure for the governance of the library, though so it was vested in 12 trustees uh, known as the governors and guardians of the library. Uh, they were the archbishop, the dean and chapter of uh, the cathedral, the Church of Ireland Cathedral in Armagh, and their successors. 
and that's why you had uh, the Archbishop of Armagh introducing you today. He, like all uh, the Archbishops since uh, Richard Robinson, have held that post as Chairman of uh, the Governors and Guardians. Uh, as well as the clerical governors and guardians, there were there was provision for two other lay uh, governors and guardians. Or sorry, two other governors and guardians. Uh, they were originally uh, cleric from the diocese of Armagh. They were to come from. They were originally clerical as well until 1886, when you had the first non-clerical or lay governor appointed, James R. Garson, uh, who came from uh, County Louth. Uh, the second uh, was James Strong from uh, Tynan Abbey in uh, County Armagh. The Act of Parliament also had uh, uh, an oath that was to be taken by um, the, the keeper or the, uh, the librarian, um, and 20 individuals have taken that uh, oath uh, during uh, the last 250 uh, years. The first keeper uh, was uh, William Lodge. Uh, who was the son of a noted uh, Dublin uh, antiquarian, uh, archivist and genealogist. Uh, this painting from the County Museum collection in Armagh shows him as a student, so he wasn't quite as young as that particular painting, but it's the only one that is known to survive uh, of him. Um, and perhaps the most noted of uh, the keepers uh, was uh, Reverend uh, William Reeves, who occupied uh, the post in the, left of the second half of uh, the 18th century and was himself a renowned scholar and very much uh, responsible for building up uh, the collection. Um, in accordance with the Acts of Parliament, the keepers uh, are uh, clerics um, and uh, from uh, 1924, uh, the post uh, uh, has been combined uh, with that of being uh, Archbishop, or sorry, uh, with being uh, Dean of uh, Armagh Cathedral. Robinson's uh, last years uh, were uh, spent um, in England, um, mainly for health reasons in Bath, and it was there that he died in October 1794. Uh, his remains were brought back to Armagh and uh, they were placed in a vault in the crypt uh, at Armagh uh, Cathedral. Um, and in his will, uh, he left to the governors of the said library all his books at present deposited in the library and one copy of all my books, uh, or all books in my possession at the time of my death in England or Ireland, in which my executors shall judge proper books for such a library. And also all my medals, coins, sulphurs, uh, by that he meant those gems in the bottom left-hand corner, which I'll speak about a little bit later, uh, prints or engravings, and books of uh, prints. In total, uh, his uh, library had uh, 8,000 volumes, and um, that uh, was both books and uh, pamphlets on a wide range of subjects, so uh, you know, obviously uh, theology, but also history, law, uh, medicine and science. Um, as uh, Archbishop, uh, he had one, uh, I suppose, uh, he you know, kind of explains why, for example, you would have found the works of uh, his predecessor of Armagh, James uh, Usher, he had several of his works, for example. Um, he also had uh, favourite authors of the day, such as James Boswell, um, Samuel Johnson, for example, uh, you know, he had Johnson's Dictionary, uh, his Lives of the Poets, uh, his uh, edited works of Shakespeare and so on. Edward Gibbon's uh, History of the, the Decline and Fall of uh, the Roman Emperor. Um, and he also seemed to have an interest in science, uh, uh, the, the presence of books by Robert Boyle, uh, who was the father of uh, modern chemistry, is anything uh, to go by. As well as that, there were uh, several noted books on architecture, and uh, many of those tended to be inherited actually from uh, his uh, brother, his elder brother uh, of uh, Ropey uh, Hall uh, in New Yorkshire, who uh, was himself uh, um, probably more than a, an amateur architect, uh, building uh, indeed uh, the Palladian residence at Ropey, the ancestral uh, seat in Yorkshire, and also actually building a, a wing or part of Castle Howard uh, for his uh, brother-in-law. Interestingly, a lot of the books, uh, at first glance, you would think they were Robinson's. They all have uh, Robinson's book plate, which is the one on the right uh, there. But actually, if you look more closely or hold them up to the light, you will actually see that uh, the Archbishop uh, Robinson has pasted his book plate over that of his elder brother, Sir Thomas's you have there on uh, the left of uh, the screen. 
in uh, his will, uh, if you recall, he mentioned uh, his collection of prints. Uh, he had about four and a half thousand prints and engravings really dating from the 15th uh, to the 18th century with uh, all of really the best known engravers uh, and printmakers of that uh, period. Uh, landscape uh, portraits like this, uh, satire uh, like this, for example, by uh, William Hogarth, or uh, portrait uh, prints, uh, which were very much in vogue for around about that period in the 1770s. And we actually have um, a, re a research uh, fellow uh, researching those uh, that print uh, collection for us at uh, present. In terms of his coins, uh, Robinson uh, collected and left Roman, uh, both Imperial Rome and Roman uh, Republic uh, coins. Um, and interestingly, as well, he tended to either collect a double uh, of each or to get past uh, copies of them so that you could display both sides. Um, he also collected medieval, uh, early modern, both British, uh, Irish, and uh, European, and also uh, there's actually uh, some American uh, coins uh, as well. And uh, his numismatic uh, interest uh, carried through uh, also into the collecting of medals. Uh, you can see a drawer of medals or casts of uh, medals uh, dating from the reign or uh, uh, really of uh, Louis XIV uh, of uh, France. His interest in uh, portrait uh, J, uh, um, uh, prints and coins uh, carried through them to gems. Uh, these sulfur impressions uh, of uh, classical Greek, uh, Roman, uh, sometimes Christian or Egyptian uh, figures. Uh, here you can see Medusa, uh, the, the, uh, the famous for her hair of snakes uh, uh, up at uh, the, the top uh, there from Greek mythology. Um, and each of these would have a number in the site if you look very closely, and that all corresponds to the catalogue of Cassie's works from 1775. And few complete um, sets of these actually survive. Uh, probably one of the most noteworthy was when uh, Catherine the Great of Russia uh, ordered a complete set for herself in 1781, so a few years after uh, Robinson. Robinson housed the gems in that central cabinet, which you have his bus uh, resting on top of there. And then the two cabinets, wooden cabinets on either side, one was for his medals and uh, the other for his uh, coin uh, collection. He never really, though, intended the library to be a static collection. Uh, he uh, intended it to grow, uh, to uh, develop. Uh, today, there are over 45,000 uh, volumes uh, within uh, the library, uh, and 17,500 of those uh, are pre-1800, and we're gradually uh, adding those to the uh, English Standard or ESTC catalogue, which is uh, the way it was publicised, and if you have this, one of our volunteers has been working hard on that, and about 6,000 or so of uh, the, those pre-1800 works are listed uh, there. In terms of how the collection grew, it was either through donation or bequest and a uh, purchase. So uh, we don't really have money today to purchase books, but uh, back in its earlier days, uh, there, there was uh, that luxury to add uh, to uh, the collection. So uh, in 1865, for example, uh, the, the manuscripts of uh, the, the first um, keeper uh, were purchased, and some of those actually belong to, to uh uh, his uh, father, John Lodge, the, the, the noted antiquary and archivist uh, from Dublin, and they included, for example, the earliest uh, manuscript copy of the Annals of Clon MacNoise uh, from uh, the 17th century, the original manuscript journals of the Irish House of uh, Commons uh, from 1613 to 18, as well as papers of the Physio Historical Society of uh, uh, Dublin in the 14, uh, 1740s, uh, which did tours throughout Ireland and uh, collected very important uh, information on uh, monuments and the, the, linen, the linen industry and so on. Uh, later in that same decade, uh, in 1689, uh, again in the period of uh, Reeves as keeper, uh, Reeves uh, managed to acquire uh, the, the manuscript collection of uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Todd, and it could within these are what are now the earliest manuscripts within the collection from uh, the late 12th century. And uh, these uh, come uh, actually from the Cistercian uh, Abbey at Notre Dame in Pontigny in uh, France, um, and a really patristic text, so text is particularly one St. Augustine, uh, but also St. Gregory, uh, St. Jerome, uh, and so on. 
But uh, it wasn't just uh, books and manuscripts that were acquired uh, for the library. In 1879, uh, Reeves acquired this stone, an oven stone. Uh, this is the earliest form of writing in the Irish language. It uh, dates from around the time of St. Patrick in the mid uh, fifth century. And you read Ogham sort of from the, the left, uh, bottom left hand corner and read round in a clockwise direction. And if you read round this, uh, it tells you that it's a burial marker uh, for someone uh, about, uh, it's about three miles uh, southwest of uh, Arma a city where this was located. And the person who's named on that actually gave the, their name to that town land from Conwell. Uh, another of the non-book collections that were noted that are noteworthy was the collection of a uh, uh, successor Archbishop of Armagh, uh, Marcus G. Bersford, who collected antiquities. Uh, sort of, uh, there's over 250 of these, uh, ranging in date from 4000 BC up until uh, about 1500 AD. So, uh, Neolithic or Stone Age uh, uh, items, uh, Bronze Age items, as you can see. Uh, swords, uh, daggers, uh, axes, and uh, so on, and also uh, ecclesiastical or church handbells uh, from uh, the medieval uh, period, uh, and dress, uh, pins, adornments, and so on from the Bronze Age. So again, another uh, notable collection. Many of these are now on display in the library's second building at number five, uh, Vickers Hill. In the same year that uh, those uh, collection of Archbishop Bersford had been donated by Bersford's son, uh, the library also uh, purchased uh, this uh, particular work, uh, which is the earliest um, uh, translation of the Bible into the Irish language uh, by uh, William Beadle. And uh, the library purchased that uh, for four guineas. And some of you may have been at a lecture on that uh, last uh, month. In 1887, uh, the library was presented with the city maces uh, for uh, Armagh. Uh, these date from uh, the time of Cromwell in the 1650s. But interestingly, someone obviously went about changing them a little bit later in that, because if you look at the top, you see the arms of uh, the Royal House of Stuart. Uh, so that was obviously added after the restoration of uh, Charles II in uh, 1616. Uh, Up until this uh, period, uh, when it came to acquiring books, uh, the governors and guardians never really acquired novels. It was more uh, non-fiction items that they tended uh, to acquire uh, as such. Uh, but we do, moving now into more uh, recent uh, acquisitions, in 1940, uh, we were uh, presented with and it was accepted this donation of Charles Dickens' first edition of Master Humphrey's uh, Clock, presented by a Mrs. Dorn Dorman of uh, Portadown. Other uh, more recent uh, acquisitions include uh, drawings by the noted uh, Belfast arch uh, artist William Connor. Uh, these were for costumes for um, a pageant at Audley's Town near Down Patrick or outside Down Patrick in County Down to mark the 1500 or 1500th or 1500th anniversary of uh, St Patrick uh, landing uh, in or coming uh, to uh, Ireland and those were purchased uh, by uh, the library um, uh, in uh, 2000. The final uh, recent acquisition that I will uh, mention uh, to you uh, was the presentation of St. Patrick's Church of Ireland music collection. And this was presented to the library in 2015. Uh, it contains 429 uh, volumes, uh, roughly about 4,000 uh, different uh, musical uh, scores or pieces, uh, ranging in date from the 17th century up to the mid uh, 20th century. Uh, they're both printed uh, manuscript uh, for um, church and uh, secular uh, music and the ink sort of pencil uh, stamping uh, markings and so on on them so that they were uh, used not only within the cathedral but also by local so musical societies like the Armagh Musical Society itself or the Armagh Philharmonic uh, uh, Society. Contained within it uh, for example uh, is an early uh, edition of um, Handel's uh, Messiah and also uh, works by the uh, Armagh-born uh, composer, uh, Charles Wood, uh, who was renowned for his Anglican choral music, uh, amongst other things. 
In terms of the library's earliest books, um, they go much beyond uh, the creation of the back, beyond the creation of the library, uh, back as far as the 1480s. Uh, books in this period are called incunabula, and the library has uh, several or uh, a small number uh, from uh, the sort of pre-1500. Uh, uh, the earliest ones uh, being uh, by Richard Ralph, uh, who was the Archbishop of Armagh. Uh, from 1346 to 1360, uh, and this particular work uh, of his was then printed uh, in Paris in 1485, um, and uh, as you say, is uh, among the, early, the earliest sorry uh, work uh, that is held, uh, printed work that is held within the library. There are also uh, many uh, other significant works because uh, they're first editions or uh, rare uh, for other reasons. We have, for example, uh, this. Um, History of the World by uh, Walter Rowling, uh, printed in London, the bottom uh, there in 1614. In terms of uh, local uh, printing significance, uh, the first printer uh, printing in Ireland was in the 1550s uh, in Dublin. Uh, within uh, Ulster, uh, the first printing press was a travelling press that came with William uh, of Orange when he landed in Carrick Fergus and made his way down to the Boyne in 1690. But the first resident press was set up then in 1694 by um, a Glaswegian, uh, Patrick Neil, who uh, was later accompanied by James Blow, uh, who actually went on to be not just his apprentice, a partner and indeed successor, a business partner and successor, but actually also uh, became uh, Neil's brother-in-law. And uh, we in Armagh have several, with none of uh, Neil's uh, works, but we do have several by James Blue, uh, that uh, second uh, printer uh, within uh, Belfast, including this uh, Psalms of David, uh, dating uh, from uh, 1720. And you'll see at the bottom they are printed by James Blue and to be sold at his shop. So all, like many printers at that time, as well as printing, they actually also uh, would have been uh, book uh, sellers. You can see there's something coming through on the back of that page. Uh, so uh, what is it? Well, it's an inscription and says here, John Wells, his book, God gave him grace thereon to look, not to look, but understand, for learning is better than house and land, for when house and land is gone and spent, learning is most excellent. John Wells is my name, 1725, age 26. And in many ways, one of the things I particularly enjoy, I suppose, is looking at those earlier problems, provenances, or where the books have come from, and the story. They obviously tell a story in terms of the text, but those uh, ma uh, marginalia uh, annotations and so on also uh, tell us uh, a lot about them and are very important from a book history uh, perspective. And we do have several uh, noteworthy um, uh, items uh, in terms of provenance. We have, for example, books from uh, the poet John Donne as well as from Ben Johnson, who's also a uh, noted uh, playwright and uh, po or poet and playwright. Um, and we have, uh, and John Donne uh, was uh, an acquaintance, I suppose, of uh, Conway, uh, the second Edward uh, Viscount Conway of Lisnagarve uh, near Lisburn. And within uh, the library in Armagh, uh, one of, I suppose, one of our internationally significant uh, items is a catalogue of uh, uh, Edward Conway's uh, library at Lisnagarve. It had 8,000 books in it uh, by uh, the 1640s, and they cover a whole multitude of topics, you know, uh, of the theology, but also uh, noted for its plays, uh, work, you know, by Shakespeare, by others, uh, the art of things in architecture, horticulture, horsemanship, lots of dancing even, uh, all sorts of things. And uh, it was thought that the library itself had been destroyed in the 1640s in the Irish uprising, but uh, it has been discovered that as well as the manuscript catalogue, uh, we also have within our man about 90 or so titles uh, coming uh, from the library of Conway or the, the Rawdon family, which uh, the Conways uh, married into. So uh, Helen, uh, Rodden, depicted here, uh, for example, has written her uh, name in one of the books that uh, we have. As you can see there, Helen Rodden bought me out of England 
and you've uh, sorry brought uh, me out of England by my mother and the date November 1691. The most famous, though, I suppose, uh, in terms of uh, previous uh, owners of books is uh, our Gulliver's Travels. So uh, the library has a first edition of Gulliver's Travels from 1726, um, which in itself would be significant, but uh, what is even more significant is the one that the library has is, got, is the author, um, uh, Dean Jonathan Swift's own personal copy. And because of um, the, the, the satire, the content, uh, the publisher was a little bit worried uh, uh, that there would be legal action taken against him. So he, uh, the publisher, Benjamin Mott, made some uh, changes to uh, the work. And uh, the, the, edition, the copy that we have uh, within uh, the library in Armagh has um, Swift's corrections uh, to that. We also have uh, several letters uh, written uh, by uh, Swift. In terms of uh, maps, uh, the library has uh, several maps um, uh, covering uh, different, uh, you know, from the 17th century onwards. There were 38, I think, from the 17th century. Uh, noteworthy among them are William, is William Petty's uh, maps from 1683, really the first uh, printed atlas uh, of Ireland. So you have this one of the whole of Ireland, then you have uh, one for each province and one for each uh, county, very much actually based on Petty's earlier down survey in uh, the 1650s. In terms of pamphlets, then, uh, we have pamphlets, uh, again, sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century would be the library's strength, uh, covering Irish history, uh, British history, uh, religion, theology. Uh, here you have one on the early years of the Orange Order. You have one on the right hand there on uh, Catholic emancipation or the Catholic uh, question. The Rosers in the Land issue, uh, ties and things like that, and really a, a, a very useful resource for uh, scholars uh, and historians working on the late uh, 17th through to uh, the 19th uh, centuries. Uh, in terms of newspapers, we have a small uh, 18th century newspaper uh, collection. Uh, probably the most interesting is uh, six volumes of uh, newspapers uh, that were collected by someone called Henry Ir Irwin. And you can see there, they're quite big fat um, uh, uh, items here with newspapers in chronological order. And uh, he actually annotates the newspaper, so uh, he, he notes things in the news uh, and writes comments on them in the, in the late uh, 18th century, so it's covering sort of the period and he's writing about things like the mental state of George III, uh, the French Revolution, uh, and so on. Um, and um, uh, in many ways, uh, I, I sort of have christened this almost like the 18th century goggle box. So he's sort of commenting on the news and things that, that are happening in the contemporary period. Uh, within one, uh, he does comment on Robinson, the founder of the library himself. And he says that Robinson was the best primate Ireland ever had except Usher. He leaves more improvement in and about our man and laid out more money for the good of the country than all the clergy in the kingdom did for a century past. They are generally greedy, proud, and overbearing. But he is a real good man of meekness, humanity, and charity. Where can you find such another? So I suppose it's uh, no surprise, maybe, that it finally ended up that collection uh, within uh, the library in Armagh. In terms of the manuscripts, I've already shown our, your earliest manuscripts uh, date from the 12th century. Uh, others uh, are really, um, I suppose, Episcopal visitations, uh, mainly associated uh, with the Church of Ireland. We also have records to do with the Corporation of Armagh, uh, the uh, introduction of pipe water into the city. Uh, we have grand uh, jury minutes, or looking at crime, law and order, uh, from uh, the, the 18th century, actually the earliest surviving uh, within uh, Ulster and the most complete. Uh, right uh, throughout uh, the century. Uh, this one you have on screen here is the census that Robinson had commissioned uh, by the library's first uh, keeper, uh, William Lodge. It lists the householders within Armagh in uh, 1770, uh, giving their trades um, and their religion. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, uh, there, from that, we can sort of calculate that there were approximately 2,000 uh, individuals living within Armagh at the time when the library uh, was founded 250 years ago. 
The library also uh, has uh, the papers of three uh, archbishops, Archbishop George, uh, John George Beresford, uh, covering the period uh, in the lead up to disestablishment of the Church of Ireland and also around the Catholic uh, emancipation uh, period in the 1820s. Um, uh, you also then have um, the John uh, J.G. Fitzgerald uh, Gregg, a collection covering, um, uh, he was Archbishop from 1939 to 59, but the archive was back sort of from the period of the First World War through during and after uh, the Second World uh, War. And more recently, uh, Robin Eves uh, has uh, donated uh, his uh, personal uh, sermons and papers uh, to uh, the library. In terms of architectural drawings, uh, I've shown you Curly's drawings of the library, Curly. Also, uh, we have several other Curly drawings, including these, which is really a pattern book uh, for the building of uh, Church of Ireland. And if you look through them, most Church of Ireland uh, buildings uh, dating uh, from uh, the late 18th century uh, onwards into the 19th century really take inspiration from some of these drawings that uh, Curly uh, uh, did uh, for uh, Robinson, which are now still held uh, within the library. We also have the drawings of Cottingham uh, from uh, the, the Victorian architect um, in uh, the late um, uh, 1830s when uh, the uh, cathedral in Armagh uh, was uh, renovated. And in terms of, uh, I suppose, another unusual item, and I'm going to finish on this before I turn now to the use of the library, is the library's flag collection. And probably the most noteworthy among the, that is this particular flag, which is a French flag from uh, the 7th Demi Brigade. And this was captured in 1798 at the, the Battle of Balnamuk in uh, September 1798. And it was captured by the uh, Armagh Militia Regiment from the French Army. And it is, fa it is in fact the only ever French, sorry, foreign uh, flag uh, ever taken in Ireland by a militia uh, regiment. So hopefully that's give you a little bit of a flavour of some of the collections and how uh, the library. This final section to turn to how the library has uh, been uh, used uh, during uh, the years. Um, it's now known as Arma uh, Robinson Library, but it was uh, until very recently known as Arma Public Library. And it really is the first uh, purpose, you know, it is the first purpose built uh, public library uh, within uh, the north of Ireland. There had been other libraries, for example, private libraries, so uh, say Mount Stewart, um, Spring Hill, some of those country uh, gentry aristocrats homes would have had private libraries. Uh, you also would have had uh, diocesan uh, libraries, uh, for example, within uh, Derry. Uh, and Rafo, for example, would have had one uh, from the 1720s or 1730s. And actually in the same year that Robinson became Archbishop of Armagh, the Presbytery of Antrim uh, founded a corporate library or a library for the clergy of the Presbytery uh, sited in Belfast uh, at Rosemary Street, and that was founded in 1765. So there were other libraries, but they were very much for uh, you know personal group, uh, individual use, or for corporate uh, groups such as uh, clergy. So uh, the, the, the library uh, that Robinson found it was very different uh, being uh, the first uh, public library. And indeed, Marsh's library uh, founded in the earlier 1700s in Dublin. Uh, it was really, uh, those that admitted it had to be gentlemen or graduates. And then it could only be men who could graduate. So uh, the, 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 the fact that this uh, library that Robinson created was open to all, uh, both men and with, with women, uh, marked it out as something very different. In terms of uh, getting admission uh, to the library, there was a declaration and promise to be made by every person before admission to the public library of our man. I'm not sure how, how well you're reading if that is, so I, I put it into print for you, but basically when you came to visit the library in those early years, you had to make this uh, promise before you could be admitted uh, to read any of the items. So I do hereby uh, declare that I have no other intention of resorting to the public library in Armagh than to read therein, and being permitted so to do, I promise that whatever book or books I may have uh, occasion to consult shall on each day be carefully replaced in a proper class or standing. 
that I will not blot, deface, or in any way damnify any book in said library, whether printed or manuscript, by writing in or upon such book or manuscript, but when in all things conform to the rules and orders made by the due government and management of said library, by the governors and guardians thereof, so as far as same shall be made known to me. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a record of uh, all the individuals who you took who made that declaration. So we don't know, you know, how many came in to actually uh, read uh, the books, at least until the visitor registers were introduced a little bit uh, in more recent times. But uh, we do uh, have uh, some borrowers registers, the earliest dating from the 1790s. Um, in those same rules and orders, uh, it was declared that no books or medals, uh, prints, dictionaries, or vocabularies, in other words, reference works, uh, could uh, be borrowed. But all uh, other books may be lent out to such persons as shall be admitted readers in said library on the depositing double the value of any set of books uh, of which they shall borrow one or two volumes, said deposit to remain in the hands of the librarian until such book or books shall uh, be uh, restored. So um, the, the actual original book of uh, borrowers is actually called the Book of Deposits. So basically, if you wanted to, you could come in and read for free, but if you wanted to borrow, you had to pay that double uh, the value of the book. So you were probably going to bring it back as uh, William Reeves reflected in the 19th century saying, this deposit quickens the recollection and care of the borrower and is found to be a wholesome check to idle curiosity or careless handling. And if you actually look down through, you'll see several sort of women uh, listed there towards the middle, for example, Miss Close, probably one of the closest up from Banagher, um, in County Armagh, listed there uh, borrowing uh, some of the books, the, the amounts uh, that they borrowed, uh, the sort of amount that they deposited, um, and provided they, bought, they brought the book back in good order, the deposit uh, would have been uh, returned uh, to them. Uh, reflecting then on uh, the use of the library, that, that was something that would have been reported in uh, the uh, Keeper's uh, annual report, uh, which uh, Reeves introduced uh, when he became Keeper. And in 1870s, he uh, reflected on the previous year as follows. The use that is made of it fluctuates very much, and the majority of persons who visit it are of the noisy and uninteresting class who get some words with the official in attendance. The first question being as to the very ancient manuscripts supposed to be preserved here. Then take some round of the room, occasionally handing a volume any way other than Connemore, in, in other words, without due care, and with a bow retire. Some intelligent visitors from England occasionally call in and express themselves in terms of warm admiration of the appearance of the library and the liberality of its rules, taking at home an impression that, after all, the north of Ireland is not absolutely barbarous. Then there are the chosen few, with whom the institution really fulfils its mission, the steady readers, whether college students or more matured inquirers. And that sort of similar vein continues for some time, and they reflected a, few, a couple of years later, that uh, the library is more frequently visited by the curious than uh, the studious. But by uh, the, the early 1920s, the number of books being borrowed uh, began uh, to uh, increase. Uh, the library also uh, uh, brought in uh, books from lending libraries, uh, Muddy's and then the Times Book Club, and that uh, extended the appeal of uh, the library uh, further. And from the 1920s, with the introduction of motor cars, uh, you, you began to get uh, parties visiting and so on, uh, you know, family groups, uh, organised tours and so on coming. And in 1925, the keeper at that period reflected that the library is certainly becoming increasingly popular, and I'm often surprised at the stiff books people uh, take out. And uh, the following year, we had a number of visitors from all parts of the world. They were so surprised to find such a beautiful library in this, a more or less a remote spot. Um, in the 1920s, uh, they also uh, purchased a letter and book weighing machine so that books could actually be posted out uh, to borrowers and you didn't have to uh, actually come in uh, to uh, receive them. Uh, there was a decline, though, uh, uh, in sort of in the 1930s with the establishment of the county libraries, uh, which tended to, uh, be, you know, uh, get uh, more, more 
use uh, for, from that period on in the 1930s. But there, there were uh, still uh, use by students and by scholars, and certain events at uh, different times were commented on for, for bringing in uh, of, uh, wider audiences. For example, uh, there were higher numbers, indeed international visitors were noted in uh, 1951, around the time of the Festival of uh, Britain. And in the late 1960s, at the time when the planetarium was opened in Armagh, you had a number of uh, visitors. The final uh, extract that I'm going to give you then uh, from uh, the Keeper's uh, annual report uh, is from 1971. And it's recorded there by the Keeper that our visiting book shows that we receive visitors from America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, France and Germany. In spite of the troubled state of the country and the bad effect this is having on the tourist industry, we had a large number of visitors during the year, larger number of visitors during the year than the number of years past. It would seem that the library is becoming more generally known even to the people of Armagh. In terms of international visitors, though, uh, I suppose there was a decline again uh, set in uh, with the, the advent of the Troubles. Uh, the, the library itself did sustain some damage. Uh, some of the windows uh, would have been um, damaged uh, during uh, bombs. There was actually an incendiary device lobbed in through one of the windows in, in the 1970s. Uh, fortunately, it uh, landed eventually on some of the stone uh, floors, so it, it didn't uh, do any more than anything more than smoke uh, damage. Uh, the other, uh, moving uh, then to sort of more recent uh, times, I suppose, uh, the uh, other uh, thing I suppose that some of you may know or have heard about uh, was when Gulliver's Travels and several other items were stolen uh, at gunpoint in uh, December 1999. Uh, we got back uh, most of uh, the collection uh, that was stolen, not everything, but uh, a lot that was brought back, uh, including Gulliver's Travels, which indeed had itself uh, went on its travels. In terms of, uh, you know, 250 years of history, there's obviously lots of events that have impacted on it. Um, and that uh, in the early minutes, for example, in 1798, you have recorded that the meeting of the governors and guardians had to be cancelled. If you look down at the bottom of that, because of the existence of an invasion and rebellion in this kingdom. Um, so it's a, a conflict and things like that uh, where, uh, you know, it's, it comes through a lot of history. In terms of more recent times, uh, particularly during the time from uh, 1989 to 2006, Herbie uh, Cassidy's time as Keeper, uh, and uh, the work that uh, the Deputy uh, Keeper Harry Carson did, uh, it really opened up the library once again uh, to students, uh, to, to visitors, uh, you had the computerization or, of the catalogue, uh, again, uh, increasing uh, the interest uh, there. In 2011, the former registry at number five, Vickers Hill, uh, was converted to a small museum space to show off the library's uh, non-book uh, collections, so the prints, the coins, gems, uh, medals, uh, and so on. Um, uh, in uh, our most recent previous uh, keeper uh, and previous chairman, uh, there would have been a memorandum of understanding established with uh, universities and um, also experts uh, brought in to, to study uh, the, the collections and look at their uh, significance. Uh, in 2017, uh, the name of the library was changed from Public Library to Armagh Robinson Library, just to, to reflect, I suppose, you know, that it was different from the general sort of public lending libraries that we have today. So whilst you could borrow from the library in the past, it is now very much a reference uh, only uh, library. And uh, then I uh, joined in 2018 uh, in, in my capacity as the library's first uh, director. The library uh, continues to take part very much in the cultural uh, life of the city, uh, right up to the present, inviting in uh, school groups, as well as uh, scholars and researchers. And alongside uh, that uh, research, uh, the library is put to lots of other uses. Uh, we have an early years program. We have uh, family uh, audiences and workshops uh, for them. Uh, we have relaxation and yoga uh, within uh, the space, living up to, us, I suppose, our motto is the healing place of uh, the soul, uh, very much. So uh, that, I hope, uh, will have uh, given you a, a snapshot, really, of uh, the library, uh, some insight into its history and the collections that are housed uh, very much uh, with uh, in it. But in this, 
I suppose at the um, year. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that the reason that the library is here is, uh, you know, the library story uh, began with that gift, that act of benevolence by uh, Archbishop uh, Robinson, um, who's depicted here on uh, the foundation uh, founding medal. And the uh, endowment that he left uh, to uh, the library to, to run, uh, to cover its core costs, is actually what still funds the library right up to the present day. It's probably, certainly not within Ireland and probably not many libraries that are still run on uh, one single uh, original founding uh, donation. And uh, that uh, has been given, uh, you know, too long ago. And um, it is, uh, I suppose, coming under more increasing uh, strain in recent years, and the library is very much at a pivotal uh, point uh, now. Uh, it doesn't receive any uh, income, for example, from uh, government like any of you know the other library, many of the other libraries in uh, Northern Ireland. And we have uh, therefore uh, launched a new uh, endowment appeal. Uh, it's been ascertained that the library really needs to raise an endowment of two million pounds, and. Um, they've been fortunate that uh, the Heritage Fund is going to match up to, to £1 million, whatever the library can raise in the period up to the middle of 2023. So just to give you a donation, as I give you an example, a donation, for example, by a UK taxpayer of, of £500. When gift aid is added to that, becomes £625. That then, because of the generosity of uh, the Heritage Fund, uh, is matched. So that original uh, donation of £500 is uh, converted to a total of £1,250 uh, for uh, the library. So, um, uh, as I say, that, that kind of is the story of the library, how it's got to where it is uh, uh, today. But for that story to continue, it very much uh, needs uh, the support of people uh, going uh, forward.